Let me ask you a question. How many times have you planned something, invited your friends and your family, gotten everything prepared just to have everybody cancel at the last minute? We all know that it happens. Probably even had it happen to us. And many times people have good excuses for canceling, coming to your event, illness, death in the family, a work emergency, a family emergency, list can go on and on. But so everybody always has an excuse. Now Craig Larson wrote, he said, business consultant James M. Bleach from Jacksonville, Florida, surveyed 110 executives to find out what excuses they hear most from their employees. Now, if you've ever worked and you've been the supervisor, you've been the boss, you've probably heard this. Heading the list was, it's not my fault. Or if you're a parent. Second place excuse was, somebody else's fault. Third is, something else came up. Fourth most often excuse was, I didn't have time. Followed by my personal favorite, we've never done it that way before. Other excuses were, no one told me to do it. I had too many interruptions. If only my supervisor really understood it. I'll get to it later. No one showed me how to do it. Excuses don't impress anyone, least of all God. As we all know, no matter the excuse, it can be hurtful when people don't show up for what you went through all the pains of preparing. This morning, I want to look at an invitation. This invitation was offered to a group of people who rejected it. They thought they were too good for the invitation. They believed that their way of thinking, their way of doing things was better than the one who invited them. Because of their rejection of the invitation, however, many others were invited to the party. But let's start at the beginning. Before the excuses, let's look at the host making the preparations. In Luke chapter, 15, chapter 14, verses 15 through 17, we read a parable of Jesus. It says, when, the, when one of those at the table who heard, had heard him, with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. <clears throat> After Jesus had been talking to his host about inviting those that were less fortunate to his banquet, one of the guests spoke up, saying that those who eat the feast in heaven are going to be blessed. This caused Jesus to tell a story on that. And in this parable, Jesus implied that when this man began to plan his great banquet, he sent out invitations. Before he began to prepare anything, as any smart person does, he invited his friends and family to get a head count to know how much to prepare after receiving their replies, he began to prepare this great feast. See, God had given his invitation to a nation of people, the people of Israel. God invited them to be his holy people, starting with Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob accepted their invitation to be God's people. Several of the following generations also accepted God's invitation. Therefore, God prepared their banquets. He prepared their promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Once the land was prepared, God sent his servant Moses to tell those who had been invited to come and enjoy the preparation was complete. Jesus tells us, his disciples, about some preparation that he has made. And in John chapter 14, verses 2 through 3, he says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. 
Jesus told us of his father's house. A house big enough where everyone who believes in Christ, who accepts their invitation, will have their own house. Some translations say, My father's house are many mansions. Can you imagine having a mansion in a house and there being just enough for everybody? Nobody being left out? <clears throat> Jesus told his disciples that he was going to the play to prepare this place for him, and he's preparing it for us. And then when the preparation is complete, Jesus will come back and he'll take us to be with him. And this invitation is still being accepted even some 2,000 years later. It's still being extended to those around the world 2,000 years later. When a person accepts Christ as their Savior, they accept their invitation to the house of God, to this great banquet in heaven. The preparation is going on even as I speak and we are here today. And one day that preparation will be complete. God will send Jesus back to get his people, the people whom he has invited and who have accepted the invitation. But in the meantime, Jesus also prepares a banquet for us and he invites us to take part in this banquet every week. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26, we read it every week. It says, For I received from the Lord, and I also pass on to you, the Lord Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave him thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We don't read this last verse, but it's just as important. It says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Every week we are invited to take the bread that represents Christ's body that was beaten and hung on a cross as a final and perfect sacrifice for our sins. We're invited to drink the juice that represents the blood that Christ shed to wash our sins away. This great banquet was pre prepared for us as a memorial of the sacrifice of the love that Jesus has for us. In joining in this great banquet, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes to call us to that great banquet in heaven. This banquet reminds us weekly about what Jesus did for us. However, as always, there will be people who come up with excuses, excuses. Going back to Luke chapter 14, verses 18 through 20, it says, But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Those who were invited received a second invitation when the preparation for the banquet was complete, but instead of going to the banquet, the invited guests began making excuses. The first said, I just bought a field. In other words, I have to go to work. I have to check on my investment because if I don't, all my time and effort will be wasted. You see, in our world today, work gets in the way a lot. People all over the world choose to go to work on Sunday instead of coming to church, instead of coming to the Lord's table, the banquet that we have weekly to remind us of Christ's sacrifice. And remember the excuses that we talked about that the executives were given. See, when it comes to church, most people won't even use church as an excuse to get out of work. They don't even use church as an excuse to get Sunday off. You see, we have a great banquet prepared for us every week. The bread and the juice are a reminder of the new covenant. However, we often, often use work to avoid attending this banquet. The next excuse. So I just bought five oxen. i got to go check them out. In other words... I just bought a new fishing boat. I gotta go fishing. 
Or I just bought a new camper, I've got to go camping. Or I just bought a new set of golf clubs, I've got to go try them out. Sunday is a perfect day to try out my golf clubs. Or my personal favorite, I just bought a new TV and I want to watch the game. Not only do we let work keep us from coming to the banquet that we have on Sunday morning, well, we can't use that as an excuse when the boss gives us off on Sunday. We turn to our hobbies, to our other entertainment. See, it wasn't that many years ago where there weren't very many places that were open on Sundays. There were no activities scheduled on Sundays. But these days, there are sports tournaments for children on Sundays. Sundays has become the best day for us to enjoy our hobbies and the things that entertain us. Therefore, instead of coming to the banquet of the Lord's Supper, we use our hobbies as an excuse. Or the third excuse that a lot of people use today is, I just got married. In other words, my family is more of a priority to me than God. Now I understand that there are times that we need to take time and go and visit family that may live out of town, and that's understandable, and God understands that, but you know what? Go to church with them. Or even better, if they don't go to church, invite them to go to church with you. Find a church wherever you're going to visit and go to church. We did that last year with my biological mother. She went to, she hadn't been to church, I don't see, I'm 42, she hadn't been to church in 65 years, except for that one time. But she was willing to go. But now when we're talking about the Bible, we often refer to Adam giving the, or Eve giving Adam the fruit of the forbid, forbidden tree, right? And Adam blamed her when God confronted him. He said, she made me do it. It was all her fault, right? But when it comes to the Lord's Supper, we like the excuse of, well, my wife wouldn't let me come. Or my husband wouldn't let me come. Or my kids had something that they had to do that was more important than bringing them to church. It may seem like people this morning are placing more importance on obeying their spouse rather than obeying God. But in reality, it's just an excuse. Most of the time, it isn't even their spouse that won't let them come to church. It's probably the fact that they just don't want to. They just don't want to admit it. But no matter the excuse, it's not good enough for God. <coughs> not only do people make excuses out of work, out of hobbies, out of family, sometimes it's just because they don't want to hear the Word of God. They don't want to hear the truth of God's Word spoken. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, and we see this more and more as we go throughout history, it says, For a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. Instead of using excuses, they just blame the preacher. He steps on my toes too much. My personal favorite, his sermons are too long. Or, he doesn't call me enough. He doesn't visit me enough. I'm not getting fed when I want to be fed. Not having my ears tickled. We're told that people will come to a point when the truth is so hard to hear that they will only listen to those who say what they want to hear. Who will tickle their ears. Who will make them feel good about everything. They won't preach on sin. They won't preach on the punishment of sin. They won't preach on forgiveness. Because if you don't preach on sin, you don't need to preach on forgiveness, right? If you don't have nothing to be forgiven for, why preach on forgiveness? Right. Now turn away from the truth. But instead of admitting that, they find excuses. From work to hobbies to families or even to the preacher. See, their excuses are more important than their relationship with Christ. That not only do they miss out on the weekly Lord's Supper, but they might miss out on that great banquet in heaven someday. But by not coming to the banquet, they open the door for a new invitation. And in Luke chapter 14, continuing in verses 20 
1 through 22. It says, The servant came back and reported this to the master. And the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out in the streets and the alleys of the town, bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. So the servant said, What you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? We went out and told some people about you. Jesus said there's still room to go just home. Amen. Because those who were invited to the banquet refused to come. The master sent his servant to the streets, to the alleys, to invite those who were down in life. The poor, the blind, the crippled, and the lame. When the people that Israel, people of Israel rejected God's covenant, God put a plan in motion for a new covenant. He sent His Son, Jesus, into the world. Because of the Jewish leaders, and many of the Jewish people thought that they had it all figured out, they rejected not only the old covenant, but they rejected the new. The Jewish religious leaders believed that they had everything right, that their ways and their traditions were the way about going doing things, that they were the righteous ones. And they refused to attend to this great banquet. Therefore, Jesus sent his disciples out to invite others. They left the temple. They left the synagogues. As we should leave the church. And went out in the streets. And into the alleys. Telling people about Jesus. Many people be believed and began to follow him. And even today, if we go out in the streets and we go out in the alleys and we share Jesus, many people will come to accept Him and to follow Him. But even after that, there was still room at the table. So Jesus continues in verse 23 and 24. It says, Then the Master told the servant, Go out into the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be filled. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Because so many of the Jews rejected God's invitation to His banquet, many seats were left open. There were a lot of Jews that accepted, but a lot that rejected. So Christ sent His disciples to the Gentiles. And there's two people in this world. You're either a Jew or a Gentile. You don't have a choice. You're one or the other. You've been invited to the banquet. Now, now they were sent out not just from the streets and the alleys of Jerusalem, now they're sent out to the ends of the earth to invite everybody to come to the banquet. Many will refuse. We know that, but many will accept the invitation. Jesus says we don't know who's going to accept it, who's going to refuse, so just tell everybody. He didn't say don't tell the person you don't like. That's the first person we need to tell. While many will reject Christ, many will accept Him. In Galatians 3, verse 8 says, The Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentile by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham when he said, All nations will be blessed through you. Not only are the Jews invited to the great banquet in heaven, but the Gentiles are too. Because so many refused to attend, there was still... Seats left open for us. For you and I to attend the great banquet of God. You and I are not only invited to the Lord's table, the Lord's supper every week, but we are also invited to enter the Father's house into a place that Jesus is preparing for us to partake in the great banquet in heaven. People from all nations, all walks of life, poor, rich, broken, exalted, humbled, are invited to this bank. It's God's desire that His house to be full, that no room or seat at the table is left empty. Therefore, not only are we invited to the banquet, but we must also follow the mission that God has given us to invite others come to this bank. We're not only to accept the invitation, but we are to go into the streets 
and the alleys of our community and invite others. We are glad in the country roads, into the highways, and invite others to come in. We are to go out, because we can't do it here. They weren't coming to the master's house to come to the banquet. They had to go out and be invited. So we got to go out, sharing this great invitation with everybody that we come across. While many will refuse, the invite, many will accept it. Jesus said that we are to compel to make them, to remove their excuses, to persuade them in whatever ways that we can according to His Word, in love, to invite those to come in, to accept Christ as their Savior, to come and attend the Lord's Supper every week, to attend that great banquet that Christ is preparing for us as we speak. But in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, Jesus told them, says, He told them, the harvest is plentiful. Folks, I'm here to tell you the harvest in Bibi is plentiful. The harvest in your neighborhood is plentiful. The harvest in our schools is plentiful. But then Jesus says, says but the workers are few. And I'm here to tell you the workers are few. You can look around this room and you can see that the workers are few. So as Jesus said, what did he say to do? He said, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. There are many out there in our community that are still waiting on an invitation. Believe it or not, there's people right here in our community that's never heard the name of Jesus Christ come out of the mouth of a Christian. They've heard the name, but it's been used wrong. And it seems like there's less service each and every day to invite people to come in. Therefore, should, not only should we go out into the harvest field, but we should pray that God will provide more people who go out into the field. There's no excuses that God's going to accept for us not going out. We're going to stand before Him one day, and He's going to ask us, I prepared a field for you to go out and harvest. Why didn't you go harvest it? Well, God, I didn't feel like it. Yeah, God, I got too old. God, I didn't want to. God, we've never done it that way before. It's the preacher's fault. It's his job. He's supposed to do that. God's going to look at you and say, Yeah, depart from me, for I never knew you. I gave you an invitation. You gladly accepted, but you refused to invite anybody else. It's a simple task. Invite somebody to church. Invite somebody to Bible stuff. Invite somebody to eat dinner with you that you know is not saved and you have a personal relationship with them. You know they don't know Christ as their Savior. Invite them to come to your house and eat dinner with you. Show them the love of Jesus Christ. And then they're going to want to know where that comes from. Invite the person that you work with that don't like you to come to your house and eat with you. That's really going to throw them for a loop, right? But it's going to open the door for us to invite Jesus, uh, to invite them to this great banquet. There's a great harvest out there, and there's a great banquet each and every week, but there's a lot of empty seats. We're going to go out into the streets, into the alleys, in the roads, in the country lanes, in obedience to the Master and invite people to come to this weekly banquet. And as they come to this banquet, they're going to hear the Word of God, I promise you. I'm not going to tickle their ears. They're going to hear the Word of God and they're going to want to come to that great banquet in the Father's house. We're going to sing about mansions and that homeland. And they're going to want to know more about that. You mean, wait, wait, you mean I get a mansion? I get a crown? Hey, tell me more. They're going to be able to come to that great banquet that Christ is preparing. 
See, we have that invitation, but we are also to share that invitation with others. When you look at our invitation, it doesn't say plus one. It says plus as many as you can bring with you. If you got to go get a van, go get a van. If that van has to run two or three times a day, run it two or three times a day. See, God's table's never going to run out of room. Every time it seems like every seat is full, more are going to be brought to the table. Therefore, we must continue to invite people, even those that refuse at first, because they might eventually accept their invitation. We've got to keep inviting and bringing people to Christ. This morning, have you accepted your invitation? Or are you still finding excuses? Have you accepted your invitation? Are you inviting others to the great banquet and to the banquet that we have every Sunday to remember what the Lord has done for us? See, there's a great harvest field right here in our community. We need to get out into the field to reap, reap the harvest. But Jesus is asking, will you go? The field is prepared. The banquet's getting ready. One day he's going to send out, he's going to come and call us in. Are we ready? More importantly, if we're ready, how many are we taking with us? This is an endless, open invitation. Are we willing to go out as the Master commands and compel them to come in?